Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. This is Brian Tate with the IPA. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Our featured presentation this afternoon is by Stenson on white labeling. Um, we are um, uh, overcoming some technical challenges in terms of getting everything in order. So, but we're working to correct those right now. We hope to have that um, set aside in a few moments as we're waiting to get started and to hear from our guests, Mark Hargrave and McGregor Johnson from Stenson. Um, we do want to share a couple of things that we are working on here at the IPA and that you can expect from us um, uh, either now or before the end of June. We want to remind everyone that we have a call tomorrow afternoon, I believe at 3 p.m. Eastern time to review our, uh, our draft comment to the Federal Reserve in response to their proposed changes on the Durbin Amendment, uh, specifically regarding uh, routing and card not present. And uh, we want everyone to know if you don't have a copy of that letter, we're happy to send one to you. This is a long conversation and we expect um, a lot of different questions and comments to come up. So we look forward to hearing from you tomorrow afternoon. Um, want to remind everyone that we also have a call on Thursday, our monthly government relations working group call, where we will talk about all the issues we've been working on over the last month and what we think might be coming around the corner. So that is at 2 p.m. Eastern. And if you cannot join us, that call will be recorded and placed in the members only section of our website at www.ipa.org. Um, I am gonna pass the baton on to my colleague, Ben Jackson, to talk about um, some of the podcasts and other items we also are working on. Hi everyone, yeah, and thank you all for joining and thank you for your patience. A couple of items to, to mention, and, and I wanna bring up one, because uh, I see that some of my fraud prevention friends have joined this uh, call. I get bulletins from the FBI's Office of the Private Sector. They've spoken on, on these calls before, and I've tried to send them out to everyone that I think would be interested, but if you or one of your colleagues is interested in seeing those bulletins, they're kind of using the IPA as another distribution point, let me know. I'm happy to put you on that, on that list. Uh, secondly, um, in continuing with that theme, we recently published a podcast with Deep Labs where we got into the discussion of what happened during the pandemic, some of the fraud rules, and how some of them kind of got outdated or even turned on their heads in terms of their ability to identify and predict fraud. Um, I encourage you all to either go to our website or go to wherever you get the podcasts and and give that a listen. We tried to get into sort of what artificial intelligence is, what it means, how it can help companies, and how it can sort of help adapt to that rapidly changing environment. Also, be on the lookout. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, I'd encourage you to do so. We are trying to use that both as a way to showcase our members so that you all can get to know each other and be able to better network with one another, um, to share best practices, but also to share some of the information from uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and one of the things that we are working on is uh, doing sort of synopsis of our government update meetings. So if you aren't able to attend those, we did a podcast from ours last month and we'll continue to do some of those pieces. Um, I'm trying to think here. So those are several of them. We have an upcoming one, which will actually relate to this webinar with the president of Green Dot Bank, where we talk about fintechs and banking and what are the advantages and disadvantages of having a banking charter as you move into the fintech world, which is going to, I think, become an increasingly important consideration for a lot of companies out there. Um, so with that, it looks like our guests may have arrived. Not yet. Okay. Um, I, a couple of other items since I have a captive audience and I'm, I'm pleased that you all have been able to join us. One of the things that um, we have heard from, from our members is there's been increased attacks on programs through uh, customer service disputes. So certainly if you're starting to see that or you're starting to see patterns, let us know so that we might be able to um, help you and, and figure out if there's a ring or a particular organization 
uh, or bit of organized crime that is behind all of this, maybe even bring that to law enforcement. Um, looking forward into the future, uh, we have a number of items in the works for additional uh, programs like this, and we will be uh, developing uh, better, uh, uh, better systems here. So it looks like perhaps we have our guests. I think they're warming up. Just give us one second. We're getting a feedback. We'll turn it off. <laughs> um, ben, in terms of um, podcasts, I know we've been working on a number of things. Anything that people can think about coming around the corner, I know there's going to be a lot of activity and changes we anticipate, um, especially on the regulatory side and working with third parties on fraud and identifying issues that will help our members um, serve their customers better. But um, you know, we are also in the process of asking our members if you're interested in presenting during our summer of learning, which will extend into our fall semester. Um, we highly encourage you to reach out to us. We've got a number of requests from members and it's our job to highlight everything that you guys are doing to help customers and work with your business partners to bring products to the market. So then any, anything else that you can think of that might be coming around the corner? So one of the things that we're going to be looking at going forward is, is examining some of the uh, new and different ways that prepaid is being used. Some of you may have seen announcements by Blackhawk, for example, using incentives cards for uh, promoting vaccines in California, things like that. So we'll be looking at some of these different um, applications of, of these cards and of prepaid. Um, so it, it, we anticipate that you know, innovation, if anything, didn't slow down at all during the pandemic. In fact, the pandemic spurred it on. So we'll be looking at some of these new things that our members have been doing. It looks like Stenson might be ready. Mark McGregor. Yeah, we are ready to go. Wonderful. We know there are all challenges in this new world we're living in when we're 24 seven online. I wanna thank everyone for their patience and I'm glad Mark and McGregor are here to join us. Um, we'll cut short the introductions and get right to it if that works for you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you would think after 15 months of doing this, we would have it figured out, but apparently we don't. So our apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It doesn't get easier. It just gets more complicated. So thank you for being with, your, being with right, us. Right, right. Technology is great when it works. So, um, so thank you very much, Brian and Ben and the IPA. We really appreciate this opportunity to uh, be part of the Summer of Learning series this, this summer. It should be a uh, well-received and, and uh, you know, really informative uh, series of programs during the summer. And again, really happy to be a part of it. So, so thank you very much for that opportunity. We're glad you're here. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. And just for those who don't know, Stinson is a longtime IPA member. Um, we work with them on many issues, and I highly encourage you, if you're looking for someone to work with on the law side, um, to reach out to them as well as some of our other members, but Stinson does an excellent job in what they do. Okay, great. So we'll, I think you guys are controlling our slides, so if you can start those for us. Absolutely. Give us a second. We'll get those up. Okay, great. Uh, so again, if you'll, uh, today's program is, is about white labeling. And of course, anytime you're talking about white labeling a financial institution's product, you're by definition going to be dealing with a third party. And so we thought it would make sense to spend just a few minutes, we'll go through this part fairly quickly, but just to spend a few minutes giving you a refresher course, hopefully it's a refresher course, on some of the basic rules of the road when dealing with a third party as a financial institution. So whether you're the financial institution and these are your, your um, third party risk management programs or you're the, uh, you're the third party, you'll hopefully have an understanding of why the financial institution partner is asking you about these sorts of things. So if you could go to the next slide, please. 
So third-party risk management, um, again, we'll just go through this quickly. These, these are not new concepts. They've been around for many, many years. There has started to be a lot of uh, publications of regulatory expectations and guidance, oh, say 10 years ago or so uh, in, in that range. And really the most recent one, and, and I think a really good one for people, especially for, for the uh, partner uh, institution here to take a look at because it's very plain English and written uh, you know, without a lot of regulatory citations is the February 2020 publication that the FDIC put out on conducting business with a bank. Uh, a guide for fintechs and, and third parties. And that, that's a really good resource and a really quick read, but does a good job of giving you an overview of, of what the rules are and, and why, why the, uh, the financial institution partner is asking some of the questions that it's asking. Um, so again, while these are not new, there really has been a lot of focus over the last few years on third party risk management and some of the issues that pop up when um, th those uh, third party relationships are not structured appropriately. And the regulators are really concerned about operational risk. You know, does the product work the way it's supposed to work? Does the relationship between the financial institution and the third party, uh, does it operate in the way that it's supposed to? And is the product delivered uh, to, the, to the end consumer in the way it's supposed to? The CFPB has been very uh, focused on uh, this area and interactions by the third party with consumers in particular. Uh, and there's been a lot of enforcement actions. There, there are sort of some hot button um, issues and some recurrent themes that you see there. Um, if there are add-on products that have a separate charge, that, that has been a subject of a lot of enforcement actions, as well as if the third party is you know, directly marketing or otherwise having a consumer service or other direct contact with the customer. That seems to uh, be a focus of, of the regulators and their enforcement actions. So next slide, please. At the end of the day, what is, is risk management all about? It's what do you do if things go wrong or maybe better, how do you keep things from going wrong? How does, how does Kevin get his whole cheese pizza just for himself, right? That's what this is all about. So uh, next slide. So what a financial institution is supposed to do with respect to third party risk management is to have a systematic risk management program. Uh, and it really is a, a circular process where it's, it's a continuous improvement. This is not a set it and forget it kind of thing. But the components of that program are the ones that are listed here on the slide for you. Uh, conducting a risk assessment or, uh, of the product or service, doing diligence on the third party, um, appropriate provisions in your contract and ongoing oversight. So we'll talk just a little bit more about each one of these. Next slide, please. So as a part of the risk assessment, you need to identify and document the risks that are involved in the particular arrangement. And it's really important that you, that you document those risks. I mean, you could have done the best job of, of sussing out the risks in the program, but if you don't document it and, and a problem arises and the regulator um, you know, raises an issue with you, it's just not going to account. You, you have to identify and document the risks. You need to assess the complexity of the arrangement. You know, is this a fairly standard product or service that has been offered uh, by others, uh, you know, for a long period of time, or is this something new and different and does it have a lot of bells and whistles and is it integrated with other systems? Uh, so it's, it's really important to think about those sorts of things. How does it fit within the financial institution's overall strategy and your systems and your staffing? And one thing to keep in mind in terms of strategy is that, you know, this is a really cool product or service. That's, that's not a really uh, a valid strategy uh, for, for you to have here. So you need to think about, you know, how are you delivering products and services to the customer and how does this relationship fit into that overall strategy? Um, you know, today everything is about security and infosec and, and data breaches and those sorts of things. So, you know, wh what holes are you opening up in your, in your uh, defenses uh, and, and uh, what sort of information security risks are presented not only through your systems, but the systems of the third party. Uh, and then finally on the list, but certainly not least, you know, legal and compliance risks. Is this a fairly straightforward program or product? 
is it clear what the regulatory disclosure requirements are, or are you doing some things that are novel and, and uh, are in the gray area, so to speak? Uh, next slide, please. Then in terms of diligence, this is again a lot of just common sense, but obviously you want to do background checks on the, on the principles of your third party. Uh, again, you need to document what you did. Um, and you need to understand the, the, the history of the third party and how they have performed in the past. You know, it, again, is this a new startup? Have they been in business a long time? Uh, have they been in trouble? Uh, you know, have, have they had run-ins with the regulators in the past? Have they partnered with other financial institutions? If the product or service would require them to, be a, uh, to have a license of some kind, do they have that license? And then again, as I mentioned, everything is around InfoSec and business continuity and all the systems these days. So what sort of testing have you done with respect to the third party systems? It's very, very important. And then one thing that's not on this slide, but you also need to think about the financial position of the third party. Uh, because here in a little bit, we're going to talk about uh, contractual provisions. And of course, one of the important things when you're dealing with a third party is to be sure that you have solid indemnities from that party if something goes wrong. But of course, the best indemnity provision in the world is no better than the balance sheet of the party who's giving you that indemnity. So what kind of financial strength do they have or do they have insurance, you know, E&O type insurance that might step in? Those are very important things to think about as well. Next slide. Now, I'm going to run through these very quickly uh, in terms of things that you ought to have in your contract with a third party. It's really common sense when you stop and think about it and, and really the sort of thing that you would want to have in any sort of, of agreement, really. Uh, but you, you want to be clear about the nature and the scope of the arrangement. So who is providing you know, what services to whom and the terms under which they're provided, SLAs and, and all of those sorts of nitty gritty contractual provisions. Uh, you know, we've mentioned legal compliance early, uh, you know, as part of the diligence and a part of the, of the strategy. Well, it, it flows through here as well. You need to be really clear in the agreement about the responsibility of both parties to comply with all of the alphabet soup of regulations that we all deal with on a regular basis record keeping obligations. You know, what records is the bank keeping? What records is the third party keeping? Um, what sort of access do you have to each other's records? How long are they maintained? All of those, again, just bread and butter provisions. Uh, and this is a very important one, especially if you're dealing with consumers, you know, ownership and restrictions on the use of customer information and IP. Uh, People often, you know, want to talk about who owns the uh, the customer data, and I often think about it in, in terms of, of these arrangements as, you know, sometimes the way the product is structured is when you've created a, a customer relationship with the financial institution, it's not so much that the bank wants to own that data, it's that they have to own it in terms of imposing restrictions on the ability of a third party to use it under, um, you know, G, uh, GLBA. Uh, so next slide, please. Again, uh, given everything that's gone on in the world over the last uh, several months, uh, you know, InfoSec is, is, again, you just can't stress how important that is. Business continuity, um, security breaches, how quickly do they have to be reported, uh, who has control over the process. Clearly, that needs to be the financial institution, those sorts of things. Audit rights are very important, not only by the financial institution partner, uh, partner itself, but by its regulators, right? The regulators want you to include a provision in your agreement with the third party, whereby the, the third party agrees that the regulator can come in and, and, and audit them. So that's important. And if you find that there's a deficiency, you need to have clear uh, obligations for the third party to take action to remedy those, those weaknesses. Again, as I mentioned, you know, one of the important provisions in any sort of these agreements is an indemnification. So you want to be clear in the agreement, if there is a problem, who's going to bear the loss for it, uh, who's going to indemnify uh, the other party, and if there are going to be any contractual limits on liability, which is very common, obviously. And then a really important one is 
not only responsibility for customer complaints, but also notification. Uh, you know, it's important that the financial institution know about customer complaints because that's the financial institution's customer. And so they really need to be aware of those complaints, how they're being resolved. If it's a product that involves a Reg E um, a regulated product or service, then who's going to handle the error resolution process uh, and, and how that's going to work. And then, of course, you know, if things go really wrong, um, you, how, how do you go about getting out of the agreement? Uh, what sorts of penalties are there? Are there transition provisions, you know, wind downs or, or other provisions that would allow the third party a, a bit of runway to find another financial institution partner so that their, their product or service is not just, uh, you know, terminated immediately. Uh, next slide. And as I mentioned, you know, this is not a set it and forget it sort of thing in any, uh, in any sense. And so you really need to have ongoing oversight. Uh, you know, it's not enough to have ironclad provisions in your agreement. Uh, you need to actually go out and monitor whether the third party is complying with those uh, obligations that they agreed to in the, in the contract. So you, you need to be able to monitor their performance, keep a uh, handle on losses, you know, are, are the losses in the range you thought they were going to be, or if for, if for some reason are they way out of the ballpark? Uh, that probably means you need to go back and sit down and, and decide what the issue is and try to come up with that reading, remediation plan that we talked about. Again, uh, especially if it's a consumer product, what's the process to make sure that disclosures are being provided uh, in a timely fashion? Um, control over marketing is, is a is very important thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some recent um, uh, enforcement actions and uh, new FDIC regs dealing with um, uh, the FDIC's logo and representations of deposit insurance. But you know the, the bank will really want to make sure that all of the marketing and other materials accurately describe whose product it is and what the role of each of the parties are. And um, then again, there needs to be an ongoing process that feeds uh, the information to, to the financial institution of the type that we talked about at the beginning. So you know, while you want to understand at the outset the financial position of the company and how their infosec and, and disaster recovery and other products work, you need to have an ability to make sure that's happening on a regular basis through the delivery of financial statements and you know, SOC 2 reports and, and those sorts of things. So that uh, again is, is a, an intentionally uh, quick uh, summary of uh, third party oversight with, with one additional um, uh, point to be made on the next slide. And that is that the financial institution obviously has to have sufficient resources to make sure that they can uh, run the program that they've set out. Um, you know, just can't emphasize enough that you have to have the right people uh, involved in that process. Uh, you, 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 you know, uh, you can't just have um, one person uh, who's supposed to be doing this if they don't have the right expertise and the right background and the right support. Uh, and there needs to be this ongoing compliance testing uh, of the program as we talked about. And like everything these days, third party risk is, uh, as the name would imply, risk based. And so the more risky, the more gray the product is, the more resources you're going to need to have to support the program. So it really is that, uh, you know, you have to have the, the scales and, and the more, more risk you put on the one side, the more resources the financial institution has to have to bring to the table. So with that, and again, this is going to be another one of our technology challenges. I apologize for this. Greg and I are going to have to switch positions. So give us just a second. And if you'll advance to the next slide, Greg will talk about uh, white labeling. Everyone, just really quick as we transition here, I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, to submit them through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We'll be happy to take your questions. And if we can't get them to address them this afternoon, we will address them after today's presentation. Back to uh, back to you guys. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, we're, we're happy to address any questions. And I'll, I'll bring Mark back in to answer those. He just covered third party risk in about 15 minutes, you know, it's basically impossible to implement. It takes years for <laughs> banks to implement. Yeah. These risk issues, you know, a lot of times hindsight's 2020. And, you know, just a recent experience to share with you, the, um, 
you know, it's oftentimes a poor customer service experience that um, sheds light on, on, you know, on these risk issues. And in the last couple of months, I've been helping out a, a client um, on, a, on a bank deposit product. And they, they, there was a number of different entities involved in the kind of contractual chain and, you know, fintech companies and platforms and processors and managers. But, but ultimately, you know, there was a kind of a customer service failure and a oversight failure, but um, it, relating to a, 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 a hold, a clearly permissible hold on a uh, bank account product that they were implementing to pre prevent fraud. And there was no issues under under Reg uh, CC or anything like that. The uh, but this particular customer had a horrible customer service experience. And you look at the the transcript of the. You know, this is via chat, so it's um, you know anyone can see the you know get the transcript and. Uh, you know, it was like a who's on first routine for the for this poor customer. They just wanted to get their, their money out. Um, but anyway, they ended up complaining to the regulator. The, the regulator had, you know, started making these inquiries to the bank and the bank, you know, starts, you know, making these inquiries of the other, uh, you know, subcontractors on the uh, in, in the chain. And it just from a, a tiny, you know, a tiny little complaint and, you know, you know, Ended up being just all we had to do was update the the T's and the, the terms and conditions. In that case, uh, we were we were lucky that you know the the, in, the customer interface had um, uh, you know had a, received the acknowledgement of the consumer to the to the policy hold. But it wasn't clear, I don't think, to the bank that this policy hold was ever taking place, and it certainly wasn't clear in the the actual original cardholder agreement. Uh, so there's, there's oversight issues there, clear customer service issues there. And you know that, that's where we see a lot of these risk issues pop up is obviously after the fact, um, but but the front line is the, the, a good customer service experience can can help can help a lot. Um, and I'll segue into light into white labeling now, and and this is just fraught with third party risk uh, concerns. Um, I'll, I'll start with what I, when I when I refer to white labeling, it's essentially banking as a service on on steroids. Uh, the banks are opening up their their APIs and and letting third parties build build products uh, with with the bank's infrastructure or the bank's you know, software provider infrastructure that they've they've set up, um, and so why are these uh, companies coming together to do this? You've got the disruptors on the one hand and the banks on the other hand, and these these are not natural partners historically. But the you know there's so many fintechs being established um, you know, every every year, and they need the bank services and they, they can't do, you know, they can't get licensed or they can't get the charter in time or with, you know, with, uh, in a reasonable budget. So they, they, they need the banks um, in particular because they have a, a product that's ready to go to market or uh, some short term profitability goal or, uh, or, or other, you know, outcomes in the licensing process that aren't clear. Um, very important, you know, the customers these days really want an integrated uh, experience. Um, from their perspective, you know, it, it's not, they get a bank product over here and they get, you know, their, their other products over here. It's all one interface. It's all seamless to the customer. And that's what, that's what they're seeking. Um, and, and banks are becoming more well-versed in, in, in implementing these uh, services. The, um, and, and their software engineers are, are, are ready to go on these. And a lot of the, you know, it seems to us that, there's a there is a general. Um, I think everyone used to trust banks a lot, and no one trusted new startup fintech companies. I think that's changing a little bit. I think people are. It's kind of more of a level playing field in the in the trust area. The both companies, the the bank and the the fintech, you know, are entering into new territories and clearly new revenue opportunities, some cost savings for the fintech involved in these relationships, and. The good news is for the banks is is that it can also you know it can be a very low margin high volume uh, play play for the banks involved, and uh, in particular on the slide here, the you'll see what the banks can offer uh, on the right hand side, um, the third one down money transmitter licensing is the the number one concern that uh, that we always have when we either have a new fintech client or a or a, a bank working on a fintech program. Um, you know, no one wants to spend the money to research these issues or to resolve them up front. And I think we understand that. Uh, we, we do hope to restructure 
uh, you know, items in a compliant way, um, you know, when we can, and certainly it helps to, to address that at the outset. Uh, but that's the number one issue. I, fintech companies aren't focused on money transmission. They, the, the legal documents don't adequately, you know, avoid or, or write uh, to avoid the, the licensing issue. And, you know, regulators will read what the consumers can see. And a lot of times inadvertently, it, it, it shows that the, the fintech company, you know, is a money transmitter. That's really not the case. It's just a, it's a either you know, an overstepping of, of you know, a, they're, they're not really doing this, but that's what, um, you know, if you read the document, that's what it says. Um, so you really have to limit, try to limit what, what the fintech is doing um, it, when you when you write those disclosures. It's just it's just very important. The, the regulators are all over all over fintech companies, um, but a lot of times the banks have to step in and be in the funds flow, you know, be, be the provider of the accounts or the cards um, for for the fintech companies to to adequately address those licensing concerns. It takes them out of the the, the money transmission money transmission analysis. The funding and capital, you know, this is becoming increasingly um, prevalent. You know, banks are investing in fintech companies um, and, you know, it, it's an exit strategy for fintech companies. Clearly banks help remove obstacles for, for fintech companies in terms of technology, compliance. They've got teams uh, oriented, um, you know, to, to this and do this on a daily basis. On the, on the fintech side of the equation, the, the branding is 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 their key, and that's the essence of white label products. It's it's the brandability, and the the fintech wants to maintain wholesale control of the brand. Uh, you know, pricing, packaging, um, boosting brand awareness, and these white labeling. Uh, no, I see a Q and A question. Should I try to click on that? Do you have the do you, do you have to use the bank's name if the fintech doesn't want to get a money transmission license? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Um, the uh, yes, I mean you you want to be able to disclose. Uh, in another example, we had in the last couple of months here, the um, a state regulator was looking at a at a website, and it wasn't clear that who the banking services were being provided by. And, and the the fix was that, and this was a nice. I mean, this was a nice, kind regular trying to be helpful. We had to add a disclaimer to the the, the all web pages that the the, the uh, banking services or the payment services were being provided by the bank. Um, and, and so, yes, I mean, I think that is key is to bring the the bank and its name in into play when when describing the 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 services that could could give rise to the money transmitter concern. The uh, on the if that didn't answer the question, feel free to uh, re respond again on the on the Q and A. The um, you know fintechs are, are are really good at delivering the customer experience, and, you know, onboarding customers, and you know, and, and hopefully running their platform. And that, that's where that's where the, the, the pros for the, the fintech um, come in, and that's what they need to do in these relationships. Uh, that's um, the banks have the compliance; they've got the licensing, the charter, and the fintechs need to um, step up on the, the platform and delivery and customer experience. Okay, I'm on the next slide. So, so here, here you'll just see a couple of examples and, and we'll come back to this Chime one because it's not a, uh, it turns out this wasn't a great example to put on here, but um, you know, this is the branding of, of these products and you can see the the textual, you know, uh, disclosures beneath it. You know, very very confusing. Uh, but the attempt here's what's going on. They're trying to attempt to to describe who's doing what and, and, and protect the fintech and the bank and this product uh, by by saying who, who which entity is exactly doing doing what. Okay, next slide, please. On. White labeling risk. So the first bullet point: customer confusion. That's what that prior slide is trying to address. Is is, is who is um, what what entity is doing which which service? The but for the for the fintech, you know, oftentimes there's a, a UDAP concern. You, you know, you have to disclose in the T's and C's uh, the account agreement, uh, the 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 app terms of use, whatever you want to call it. You know, which service is being performed by whom. 
and that helps you on the licensing issues for the fintech. It helps on, on UDAP claims, and but it's at odds with the branding. So that you know the, the fintech wants to have this whole thing, you know, reflect its uh, name, its goodwill, and when you start, you know, you're, you're trying to minimize what the, the fintech does and, and essentially enhance what the what the bank does in a, in a number of respects. And but so those those are kind of conflicting. On the reputational risk, you know, the, the, there's risk from these products. There's risk from the companies. So it, it's a, you know sometimes it might make sense to exclude you know certain uh, products entirely, or you know address some on a case by case basis. Clearly, you know all the third party risks about diligence and your counterparties would would apply here. Um, uh, on the privacy and, and data sharing, I mean this is a, I mean these fintechs have so much data and making sure that where they're collecting data, it's authorized, how they're using it, it's authorized. So this would be you know, in, in the contract between the bank and you know, its counterparties and in the consumer facing materials. Very, very important that that's um, accurately depicting what's, what, what, what's taking place. On the, the loss of brand identity, the last bullet point, and this is where the, you know, the FinTech has to make a decision. I mean, this is not, it's not all, um, you know, this is just a downside of the relationship for them that they, they could lose some of their branding identity and you know that's just a, a question that, that they're gonna have to, to, to deal with because the bank will want to play up its role um, to protect the compliance aspect and the reputation aspect of these products okay i'm on the next slide thank you so recommendations for risk management there, there's some steps here and identify our organizational risk tolerance and develop policy. So this could just be a lot of questions that you, you have to be addressed. And you know, for the FinTech, does adding the bank make sense? Do we have a, you know, a way to win against competitors without, the, without this payments offering? Um, you know, for the banks, can they transform themselves into a, a, you know, a banking as a service model? Um, you know, are they doing it in-house? Are they outsourcing it to you know, third-party en you know, engineers? Where does the bank take this? Is it specific, ter you know, geographies, specific consumer um, markets? Are we calling it? Are, are we doing it as a you know white labeling? Are we doing it as co-branding? So lots of policy questions to to wrestle with. Um, step two: follow third-party risk guidance. And we couldn't. Repeat this enough. Uh, but that's what was talked about in the first first segment. Items three, four, and five: um, disclose the bank's role, provide FDIC advertising disclosures, including the bank's name and, and chartering authority. This goes to one of the questions we just uh, answered there. But uh, this leads to like horribly clunky disclosures, right? I mean, they're not customer friendly. Um, unfortunately, they're just it's just, it's just hard to. To, to state exactly who is doing what and, and, and make it so that it's easy, easy to understand. Um, but again, that causes the branding problems, but, the, but this is what needs to happen. They, the bank needs to be prominent, um, both in the text of the agreements, the periodic statements, um, obviously include the FDIC disclosures uh, with reference to the bank, not the FinTech company. And item six, be careful about data privacy compliance. So that's a review of, of where information is collected, how it's used, and making sure the documents are uh, consistent with that. Okay, next slide. Future of white labeling. I mean, the, we, we see this as, oh, as exploding. Uh, this is gonna keep building uh, in the banking space. The, the the number of the regulatory attempts at this have not, uh, you know, Cut back on this, and the fintech charter, you know, has, has gone nowhere. Um, state regulators are, you know, coming after, you know, everybody for, you know, for lots of reasons, but in particular, money. Um, so we think specialty banks, other banks, will continue to focus on banking as a, you know, a service, uh, white labeling. You know, we see a lot of investments by banks, uh, acquisitions by banks in this space, and you know, uh, overall, it's going to be a, you know, customer driven. Uh, model that you know the customer wants it to be integrated, wants the seamless APIs to work on on the platform, and that's all I have. Are there, are there any questions about? We have a couple more slides coming up, but are there any questions about this part?
I, I have a few questions, but I do want to remind everyone, if you would like to submit a question through the Q&A, please do so. Um, and again, if we don't get to it today, we will follow up with Stinson and get an answer for you. But I just had a quick question and that I wanted to fit into the conversation. Um, we all know how this is supposed to work in the real world and um, everyone's supposed to, both the parties are supposed to come together and come to an agreement on um, uh, all the legal issues and compliance and who is going to address what issue moving forward. Um, can you answer a question about even if you do all the right planning, how things may go if a regulator asks a few questions or as you pointed out, um, a lot of this is driven from customer experience. Uh, a bad experience can open up um, a long list of questions. And so we've all seen how uh, uh, the conversation where there's finger pointing and um, the real issues don't get addressed right away, then the dust has to settle. So. Um, generally speaking, what is your experience when, when this kind of situation arises? Yeah, you know, once, once they're on you, they're, they don't get off easily is the, is the problem. And I don't like, I personally, my personal preference is, you know, it's not a, you don't do kind of a half um, baked response. You know, you give them a big response first, you know, but both the, and I, I think, you know, obviously from the legal side, you know, what are the legal requirements and, um, you know, where in the document, point to the documents where, where your position is supported. And then the data, I mean, like in this particular instance, we were, uh, that I mentioned earlier, we were, we had a good position because I mean, there were very few, you know, complaints about this over the years. And we had the data to back that up. So we had pulled all the data, we did all the legal analysis. We did a little bit of a mea culpa saying, well, it might not be technically addressed or buried in the, you know, account agreement, but it was, clearly agreed to at the time of a transaction. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, the approach can differ uh, depending on the circumstance, but, you know, having both the, the legal arguments, the position, the support in the data, the support in the, the you know, the account agreement. Um, and then look, you know, no one's perfect. There's, we're all going to make mistakes. And in this case, who is, you know, we did, you know, we fell on our sword a little, just a very, uh, just a little bit and, um, and, and, and it went over well. And just one more quick follow up, and then I'll I'll let you continue. Um, you know, and I've had in in the past questions um, from fintechs, or at least comments from them, where they believe that a lot of this, uh, a lot of the regulatory um, interaction is on the bank. And can you just share your general thoughts on is everyone in the value chain here uh, ultimately responsible to uh, the regulators? Um, we understand that the banks have a direct relationship, but I want to talk about the indirect relationship of third parties. How do they fit in when a regulator comes knocking on the door? Are they, can they blame the bank or walk away or just say, look, we're just partners with the bank providing a service? Um, the, well, I mean, a lot depends under the contract between the, the, the parties, between the, the bank and the, the FinTech company. I, in most almost all circumstances the fintech company has you know a lot of indemnification of you know in favor of the bank um, for regulatory issues that arise um, the but the banks want to control the dialogue with the regulator and, and that's almost always the case and it, it, you know, in this case we were just preparing a lot of the letters and data for the bank to use um, in its response, because the, the inquiry did go to the bank, not not the fintech company. The you know if the, if, if the regulator you know is directly um, inquiring of the fintech company, I you know I think it's probably on the company to notify the bank that that's happening and, and make sure that you know that, that the bank is comfortable with the fintech dealing directly with the regulator because um, it's uh, it, it, it's usually always the, the it's usually it's usually the bank's regulator right and, and but they do have authority over over the, the third parties to, to 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 dig in on those on those third parties uh, but I I think the banks want to control those uh, conversations and the correspondence even though under the terms of the contract the fintech company is is um, usually responsible for some indemnity. No, thank you. Appreciate it. I will give you back the floor. Great. And I'm going to, we're going to swap positions again. So hang on one sec.
Okay, so uh, if you go to the next slide then please. Um, and this sort of, in, in some ways, goes back to one of the, the question that was asked earlier about you know naming naming the bank. And I guess I would say a couple of things as it relates to the money transmitter point in general, uh, or, or specifically, but it, but it applies to uh, you know many issues that, that cut across third party relationships. And that is you know not only do the agreements and the disclosures and the terms and conditions have to be crafted appropriately and be clear about who's providing what service, but the actual operations have to be set up correctly as well. I mean, you can, you can be very clear that the bank is providing the money movement services, but if the, if the third party FinTech actually touches and controls the money, it doesn't matter what the agreements say. So you really have to have everything in sync here from an operational perspective and from a documentation and disclosure perspective. Um, so anyway, we, we thought we would talk about this very recent development uh, towards the end of March, uh, March 29th uh, of this year. Um, uh, there was a, a settlement agreement that the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation uh, <clears throat> had an investigation with respect to Chime. Uh, and uh, California has a statute, most if not all states have a statute that prohibits a business from using the term bank or, or otherwise leading the public to believe that it's in the business of banking unless it actually has the authority to act as a bank. Uh, and so they looked at a number of uh, things that caused them concern with respect to Chimes operations, you know, including the fact that uh, if you wanted to go to their internet site, it was chimebank.com and that they used uh, bank and banking and, and similar terms in their marketing and, and, and disclosures. Um, so next slide, please. So what, what this uh, settlement agreement does uh, is it makes it clear that Chime has to, you know, as much as it can distance itself from the, using that term banking. And so uh, they have to, among other things, put a disclosure uh, on their website and their marketing materials and, and, and whatnot saying that they're not a bank and that the um, services are provided by their bank partners. And for you know searches and and, and other uh, materials, they have to identify who those those bank partners are and, and the requirements about you know how big it has to be or boldface type. It's very specific about how Chime has to do this going forward. Um, it's got to ensure that customer customer uh, testimonials don't represent Chime as a bank, and if they do, they're supposed to have a process to go in and say, nope, you know, thanks for the comments, but we're you know we're not a bank. Uh, our, our banking partners provide the banking services. Um, you know, they they can't refer to their to to the product as a Chime bank account or that you're opening an account with Chime. Instead, it's that you're opening an account through Chime. Uh, and, and so, again, it's just those little nuances that can make a big difference. Um, and, you know, they, they can describe themselves as a financial technology company, a marketer or a processor. But at the end of the day, the banking account is provided by its banking partners. Um, they have to have a series of FAQs that are supposed to go into, you know, a lot of detail about uh, how the relationship works and, you know, which hat each party wears. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the takeaways? Well, it's the, it's the things that we've been talking about, right? The, the, the customer facing documents are just very, very important and they have to be accurate, right? They have to say who's providing what and, and, uh, and, and which, which entity is ultimately responsible uh, for the product or service, which in this context, it's going to be the bank account or the card or whatever it is. And those, those are with the bank their bank products, their bank obligations that are being marketed through a white label arrangement with a, uh, with a third party. Um, so again, just some hot buttons to, to, to think about. Don't, don't characterize the, the FinTech as, as a bank or as providing the, the payment product, the bank account or transmitting money, unless of course they have a license to do that. Uh, as Greg alluded to, uh, you know, we've seen situations where just inadvertent descriptions uh, in, in marketing materials and terms and conditions have created problems. 
Now, if you if you're lucky and you uh, you know in this context or example that Greg was mentioning, you're able to work with the state regulator. Um, you might get off with only having to put some additional disclaimers or disclosures explaining the services. If you're not so lucky, especially in the money con uh, money transmitter context, you know the penalties can add up very quickly in, in that space. So it's really important. Uh, to be sure um, that all of your disclosures have been run through compliance. Uh, again, this goes back to one of those very first things in third party risk is, you know, making sure that you've got a control process in place over marketing so that every piece of marketing, uh, you know, gets reviewed by, by the bank's compliance department or that you've at least got some rules of the road about, you know, you can't refer to the account as the XYZ account. It has to be, you know, the account of the bank that's open through XYZ, you know, those sorts of, uh, of general principles. Um, so the other recent development that really kind of ties into uh, this Chime situation and not misrepresenting the, the, the fact that it's a Chime bank account or again, an XYZ bank account and, and that's FDIC insured is um, brand new regulations that the FDIC just recently proposed. And I, for the last time, I'm going to do the chair shuffle here and Greg will come back and talk to you about those. If you go to the next slide, please. Yep, we're getting our, our, our squat workout in for the day here. Yeah, as, as we all know, the FDIC has authority to bring in enforcement actions. Um, no, no surprise there. The, they did in April of, um, of this year issue a, new, a, a proposed rule uh, regarding this authority and in particular relating to how um, the FDIC name logo was, was being used. And there's some procedural uh, things in the rule, but re relevant here is that the they, they, the rule clearly highlights third party relationships that banks have. Um, and, and in this case, obviously, how the FDIC name and logo are being used there and, and expects that banks expect banks to review that as part of their diligence process on programs and products. Um, not, there's not too much novel going on there other than this is just, you know, right on point to this presentation, which brings us back to the original point, which was Home Alone is still the greatest movie ever 30 years later. So we'll, we'll, we'll field any other questions at this point. Um, and so here, you know, just the voice from uh, from outside, the comments are due uh, at early July on the FDIC proposal. So if you uh, if you have comments to, to make on that, you still got, you know, basically a month to get them in. Gentlemen, thank you. I do want to open it up again to see if anyone has any questions they'd like to submit through the Q&A. Um, with respect to Chime, and I would imagine there's probably other companies who have taken the same kind of marketing strategy approach over the years, um, and we're seeing this new transition. Are there not specifically addressing this Chime issue, but are, are there other states that you may be aware of that are looking at this closely um, in terms of marketing or advertising? or um, other uh, regulators that might have an issue with some of the advertising that's taken place over the last couple of years? So at least in, in, our, in my experience, uh, it, it's, it's not so much been state specific as it has been um, customer complaint uh, specific as, as, you know, if you have a customer complaining, it brings it to the attention of the regulator and then that starts the whole process off. So that, that in my experience, that's been the driver more than, you know, a particular state has decided that, that they're interested in, in things. Uh, you know, uh, unlike the situation on the loan side of the house where, you know, Colorado has been all over marketplace lending programs. Uh, just curious, we recently, for those who are members of the IPA online, we submitted our comment actually to the FDIC uh, yesterday and um, shared that with our members. Uh, it, this is something we've been following very closely in terms of how the uh, evolution of the industry is going. Um, now that the FDIC is here, you know, I have received questions from others. If there were other states that might want to be uh, jumping on this bandwagon, and uh, I know, I believe California didn't um, sanction Chime financially, but I know Illinois did. Um, and there could be other states that see this as an opportunity to um, rein back an in industry, but also make a little money in fines. And, and so um, we did receive a question from one of our members recently on that. 
Are there any other questions, comments, or thoughts for our guests from Stinson? I know we're at the top of the hour. I do want to ask everyone if they do have questions for uh, Mark and McGregor to send them to us. We'll be happy to forward them to uh, Stenson. I do want to thank both of you for joining us and we want to thank everyone for their patience today. Um, as we all kind of navigate this new world day by day, there's always challenges and I'm glad we were over uh, able to overcome them today. And we look forward to continuing to work with you guys. Um, you do a lot of great work. And so I will ask all the attendees, if you're thinking of a law firm to please think of Stenson um, and uh, uh, keep them in mind um, to help address some of your legal needs. And I just want to, one last comment, which is to say, we hope everyone remains safe and has a great summer this summer. Um, and we look forward to talking to all of you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great afternoon. You too.